Welcome to the Cisco Telepresence VCS System Configuration Video Guide. My name is Michael McGarry, a Product Manager within the Cisco Telepresence Systems Business Unit. This is the last of six videos which will guide you through the basic configuration of VCS. Welcome to Part 5, Status. We've actually been beginning every one of these sections with the Status Overview page. This gives us some information on the resource usage, high watermark being peak, as well as the uptime and software version. If we continue on through, we can go to System and Information. This gives us a little bit more information about the software build that we're running on the VCS. Underneath Ethernet, we can see the uh, current speed and duplex of this particular Ethernet interface that we have plugged in, as well as the MAC address. Underneath IP, we should, of course, obviously see the IP addresses here that's configured on this particular VCS, as well as DNS settings. Underneath registrations, we can see all of the devices that are registered, including a application conference factory that we configured earlier for multiway at cisco.com. In this case, we see that it is registered with 127.0.0.1, which is the local loopback interface. We also see a couple other endpoints registered. If we go into a specific registration, this happens to be H.323. We also see that this particular endpoint is registered via the RFC 1918 address space. And we also see um, each of the different types of aliases that are registered. H.323 registrations can contain multiple aliases in the same registration. SIP, though, can, can only contain one registration per SIP UA or user. We can unregister this device. However, uh, if we unregister because this device is going to try to attempt to re-register, it will immediately re-register. But this may be also a way that we can actually clear this registration and get a refresh of that particular registration. Uh, of course, as soon as I unregistered, it re-registered almost immediately. And so therefore, we already have it back uh, being registered. So if I click on it, it actually already has it registered and we see that the creation time for this registration is actually just a moment ago uh, so it was 834 and 52 seconds and it's now 835 Pacific time if we wanted to we can go to calls and this actually lists out calls and of course we don't have any calls at the moment so I'm gonna actually tell uh, one of the endpoints that's registered to this VCS to make a call to a traversal server and we're going to actually make a call all the way back to my home office endpoint. And I'm going to click dial. And we should now have an inbound call to my endpoint. And I do hear it ringing. And I'm going to go ahead and accept the call. And I'm going to take and refresh this page and we do see the call as a start time of right now and I see a source and a destination now remember we actually had configured the uh, the bandwidth limitations and we told the bandwidth limitations between uh, this particular VCS and the TSB Alpha VCS was set for no greater than 384 kilobits per second therefore that's what we actually see in the configuration here if we looked at this particular call, we can see a little bit more information about this particular call. We actually can see the call signaling addresses of each of these devices, as well as the source alias and the target alias that we dialed. In this case, we dialed michael.mcgarry.external at tamber.com, which is an H.323 ID. We can get some additional information as well about this particular call. If we view all details of this call, we actually can see all the different types of information. We actually have different types of legs of this particular call, as well as we have the session. Uh, this is not a media routed call, therefore we know that we didn't interwork a call, or it was not a firewall traversal directly from this particular VCS, so therefore we have false here. It is call routed mode, even though we have optimal set, because the endpoint that we're making the call from is registered to this actual VCS. We also see the route that that particular call made. This is from the subzone of RFC 1918 that we created via the subzone 1 to default subzone link that gets automatically created to the default subzone, which is on the box, 
and then we see a route to using the link of zone 01 to the default subzone and here we have the external VCS or the far end neighbored VCS of the TSPU Alpha VCS and that's the actual route that this VCS understood that that call actually had within the VCS itself and again this is a routing links if I were to take and make a modification to my bandwidth configurations and I go back over to my pipes and I say that I want to allow uh, 768 kilobits on this particular link uh, that might not be advisable if it was just a T1 but we know that it's a little bit larger than that so I'm going to do uh, a little bit of changes here with bandwidth restriction on the total as well as the call so now that I've set 768k I'm going to go ahead and save that and I'm going to tell the endpoint to disconnect the call uh, so the endpoint uh, now has uh, disconnected the call and if I go back to status calls calls now I do not have a call in let's go ahead and uh, make another call and we're just going to tell the device to make another dialed call to the same endpoint and I've got the inbound call and I'm going to go ahead and accept that call and I'm going to refresh the call status page and now we see 768k as the allocated bandwidth because we're allowing that call to happen that way we also see um, another column here peer uh, this actually call status page contains all of the cluster of VCS's and all the calls within the cluster but it also tells us which peer member in the cluster that that particular call is occurring on since we only have one member in this particular cluster we see it being the peer one uh, address if we click on that particular link um, it actually tells us uh, that we're going to filter just the calls on that particular peer again we can look at the view actions here and see that call again and we see that it was requested at 768k and we allocated 768k for this particular call all right, let's go on. Uh, we have a search history. Uh, search history is very important. Uh, it allows us to understand how calls are occurring and where dialed events are occurring. And in this particular case, I actually um, see that we have a uh, admission request. And this is our uh, admission request as well as the call setup message. Um, and if we go on into that particular search history, we can actually see that particular call and how it actually occurred. Uh, obviously this routed through that um, TSBU Alpha VCS and it used the rule the search rule of TSBU Alpha any alias let's go on to the local zone configurations or the local zone status this tells us that we actually have the default subzone where we have one device registered the default subzone obviously uh, did not contain 127.0.0.1 therefore the default subzone has one registration and that particular registration is the uh, multiway at cisco.com we see two registrations from RFC 1918 now since RFC 1918 is a subzone and we see one call going on we also know that it has to route through the default subzone in order to be able to get to the remote zone and in that case we see uh, that there is one call in each one of these uh, subzones the default subzone again is the default subzone on the box uh, so it would actually have all of the calls if we looked at zones we actually have all the zones that are configured so we do have the default zone on this box however it does not contain a call because of the fact that we're going through the default subzone directly to the neighbored zone and in this case this is why we see a one call to the neighbored zone we also see the fact that these two um, are actually active so we do have actual H.323 application level um, connectivity as well as SIP application level connectivity to this remote VCS. If we looked at bandwidth, we can actually look at those links that we talked about earlier. In each one of these links, um, you can actually see where we have a link uh, from zone 1 to the default subzone. And it's actually consuming uh, one call at 768K. If we looked at the pipes, these are the consumable pipes and we obviously see one pipe here which is that T1 from RCDN to San Jose that we configured and we see that it's consuming one call and a total of 768 kilobits per second if we click on that it actually goes directly to the link 
uh, that, that jumps to the edit pipe information. And we see the status again down at the bottom. As well as this particular pipe is being used in two different links. If we go back to system status and we go to policy services, this is if we're using a remote policy server. We'll actually see the status of that particular remote server. Uh, that's more of an advanced configuration, so we're not going to go through that uh, for this particular exercise. However, let's go to applications, and we're going to look at publishers. And we will actually be able to see the fact that we actually have uh, two different um, URIs registered here. We have the, three t uh, the um, conference factory URI listed, and that is a publisher, so it's actually publishing presence on behalf of it because it does have an at cisco.com as well as we see anthony.lu.office at cisco.com now if you notice over here we actually see two publishers uh, that's actually because of the fact that we have the presence user agent that is creating a uh, presence for the HR323 based endpoint as well as the endpoint natively has the capability of supporting presence for the SIP URI that it's registering as well so it's actually publishing presence so therefore we see two publishers for that particular URI. If we looked under subscribers, if we had any subscribers looking at the presence for those particular endpoints, then we would actually see that showing up here. We don't have any subscribers for that particular endpoint or any particular endpoints and, and we don't see anything. Excuse me, we don't see anything. Uh, we do have a warnings page and earlier we had clicked on that red um, triangle with an exclamation point and we actually went to this page and we basically acknowledged all of these different um, errors. Now these particular errors are not uh, a real problem other than the fact that we probably want to make a change from the default passwords. Uh, this particular box is currently using default passwords so that's why it's alerting us. We can go to the hardware as well and the hardware shows what each of the fans are on the box and the speed uh, as well as we have different um, temperature sensors on the box and we also have different measurements for each of the different voltages uh, being supplied by the power supply. Uh, we have some minimum and maximum thresholds here and if these exceed the minimum and uh, maximum thresholds then what will end up happening is, is that we'll show up as a, a warning event and it will in also send that information to TMS if this VCS is in TMS. We also can look down at the logs. We have an event log and a configuration log. Uh, if we looked at the event log, this is where we see all the different types of calls that are occurring uh, or have occurred in the past. And also all the different searches. Uh, we currently have the log settings set for one, so we are looking at basic information. If we turned this particular um, log level to four, then we would see a significant amount more verbose information in the event log. Of course, in the related tasks, we can go to view the event log directly and it will jump us directly into the event log. If I disconnected this particular call that we actually are in and reconnected it, we would see a significant amount more uh, information uh, being displayed. All right, I think that this is pretty much it. If you have any questions, please uh, do not hesitate to send me an email. That's mmcgarry at cisco.com. And thank you so much for uh, participating and uh, understanding a little bit more about the VCS and its configurations. Thanks and have a great day.